talk by. Uh, so I was trying to say that while the effective action itself in general is a non-local, difficult to calculate mess, uh, one of the simplest simplifications about ultra divergences, which we have to tackle with the process of normalization, is that um, the divergences are local. And I wanted to sort of both make that precise and also show you why that's true. Uh, so let me start with um, a very precise statement that the UV divergences at one loop order in Which I mean precisely that can be written as something at the point x, or derivatives acting at the point x. Okay. So the statement is that at one loop, if I just do the one loop approximation with the effective action, that you get stuff which is insensitive. You, you can cut it off. You can put some UV cutoff into the theory. And you'll find that the parts that are insensitive to that cutoff, as you take the cutoff to be very large, they may be very complicated non-local functions, functional functions, functionals, functionals of phi. But the divergences, the ultraviolet divergences, are here. If you want, and of course, it depends on some sort of a cutoff scheme. But uh, as far as how it depends on space-time, it depends on space-time through fields and their derivatives at the point x, and then you integrate over x. And this is going to turn out to be a great simplification for us. Um, so the uh, so we'll see why it's a nice result. But first, let's just say, what's the proof? Well, in fact, first let me translate the question into a mental space. That is that. Um, if I look at the endpoint effective action, effective vertex, which therefore depends on n minus 1 uh, momenta, because there's an overall momentum conservation for the endpoints, right? So this thing is equal to something which is polynomial
So, in fact, the statement is that the Fourier transform of something which is local, if it's just made up of derivatives and fields, if you Fourier transformed it, of course, each of the derivatives would turn into some momentum. And the fact that it's local, so you, you don't have weird things like 1 over derivative or 1 over derivative squared or any other quite crazy non-local thing like a Green's function would be. The fact that it's local, it's a polynomial in derivatives, turns into a polynomial in momentum. But so, it's, so this is very simple because it's a polynomial, but it's UV divergent. And I won't keep on saying that divergent is code word for sensitive to the ultraviolet cutoff. Whereas this may be non-analytic, much more subtle kind of function of momentum, but it, it has the virtue of being be insensitive. Okay. So if you think of the ultraviolet cutoff as really representing some new physics, string theory, whatever it is that makes, or the fact that the world lives on a space-time lattice secretly, if all of these things are way up at super short distances or ultra high energies, this part would care. It cares. This part wouldn't notice, okay? At your experimental energies, this set would say, I, I, I don't know whether at super short distances it's a space-time lattice, whether there's string theory or some other miraculous theory which solves all these ultraviolet problems, whereas this polynomial would care. Okay, so this is a separation of two subtle aspects non-analytic and momentum, from which we get interesting properties like the, in the self-energy diagram, the non-analyticity and momentum with the I-epsilon prescription was key to proving unitarity, the optical theorem. I'll go and review that fact again. The non-analyticity and momentum is, is crucial for that kind of finding interesting branch cuts because you have log of momentum and so on and so on that give you imaginary parts that are related to the optical theorem or generalized but it's finite. And that subtlety is separated from this one, which is ultraviolet divergences, but polynomial. Okay. Um, so this is a translation of the question, to which I want to, for, for future reference, add one more uh, thing. Okay. It's not only polynomial in the momentum, it's also polynomial in the mass parameters. I say parameters, all I mean is the mass in the, in the finite rules. In the free propagator, there's a mass term. That's the mass I'm talking about. Of course, it's not the pole mass. It's not what the experimentalist measures to be the mass. It's approximately the case, but it's not exactly the case as we discussed. So I'm just calling it mass parameter as opposed to what the experimentalist would say is precisely the mass. Okay. So it's also a polynomial of that. While it's a polynomial of every mass. Okay. Now, uh, proof. First, this is a statement that does not care which particular quantum field theory we're talking about. I'll draw it maybe like phi to the fourth. Well, maybe I won't draw it like phi to the fourth. Um, but, but, but it's this. What I'm about to show you, you'll see, as soon as I show you, is just true of Feynman diagrams in the most general possible sense. Okay? So I'm doing one loop, and I'm doing something that is a contribution to the effective action. So it turns out there's just sort of one category of diagram that could be. The one loop, there it is, I've drawn the loop. And then there can be things coming off it which are, however, to be amputated. So for example, if I was doing by the fourth, I would have this. Um, let, let, me, let me, since we have talked about fermions and bosons simultaneously, let me use dashed lines for bosons, such as by the fourth. So here is, a, here is an example of a, I amputate these. This is an example of a contribution to gamma. One loop. Um, notice this is not, you might say, this 
this is not a contribution to gamma one loop because it's not one particle irreducible. So, so back to this. Um, what else could I make happen? How about this? So these are fermions. Okay. So you get the picture. It's a loop. The particles in the loop may vary from propagator to propagator in general. The external lines may vary in species as well. But, but this is the structure. Okay. So what is the what is the integral that you have to do? The Feynman integral. integral were we are we being asked to do? Well, there's there's one there's one loop momentum. And look, this could be a more complicated theory. I'm just giving you an example by drawing this picture. In general, every vertex from a local action, the act all these vertices come from some action, they're all sort of I think you can think of QED if you want. They are all, you might say, well, there's a bunch of couplings. The hell with that. Yeah. I'm worried about finiteness and being polynomial. I don't care about factors of two pi forms, right? So that's that's it. So there are various couplings that you have to multiply by. But but in principle, there a local action could have some derivatives in the interaction. There could be some momentum dependence of the interaction. In that case, there will be some polynomial. And it's a polynomial on all the different types of momenta that can be here. There can be the internal momentum Q, and there could be these P's. So, so it could be some polynomial in So the product of all the Feynman vertices are a bunch of coupling constants, to hell with those, and some possible momentum dependence of the vertices. But this is coming from local, so vertices, the product of vertices from a local interaction. Okay. And then there's a product of propagators here. And uh, this will look like, so one of these propagators without loss of generality is one called Q. Okay. And so that'll have some Q squared
are some number of propagators in this loop. I'm calling that K. It's not the same as the number of external lines because sometimes you could have two lines coming out of, you could have 10 lines coming out of this vertex if I happen to have a 5 to 12th interaction and I'm trying to be general. The reason I'm trying to be general is because I'm trying to derive why we restrict ourselves to certain types of actions and not others by first considering the full set of possibilities. Um, what am I writing here? This is just some linear, this is just a linear combination of external momenta. That's all I read. I mean, it's opaque notation, but you can see all I'm saying is that this is Q, and this is, say, called P1, then this is going to be Q plus P1. And if this is P2 and P3, then this one is going to be Q plus P1 plus P2 plus P3. But in general, these C's are either zeros or ones, and there you go. Right? So, but some, I don't care, because that, this is not going to be where the action is. Um, it won't matter exactly what these numbers are. Okay? It's just a lot of things in there. Right? Um, some of these M's may be the same mass, the same species of mass, and some may be different. Like here, there's some fermion masses and boson masses. Now you might say, gosh, if that was, if that was the propagator Q, then why did I write a, a, a scalar propagator here? I should have written the fermion propagator. And uh, I should have said times, of course, a fermion propagator is the scalar propagator with some numerator with Dirac matrices. But that is, again, a polynomial of this sort. So it can be lumped into this polynomial. Okay. And if, if there are external spinner indices, then polynomial is uh, matrix and spinner indices. But that aspect truly is irrelevant. So I'm dropping spinner indices here, and I'm just saying times any spinner numerators. You know what I mean, okay? So this is it. This is the most general possible Feynman diagram at one loop contributing to an effective action that you could conceivably have, okay? Um, and indeed, as we will see when we we already know a little bit of QED, with a, probably a little bit of assertion as to the derivation of the propagator, but you know the propagator is some sort of polynomial up here. And again, the scalar propagator and the denominator, always it's the same, same scalar propagator. Spin only changes this polynomial. Uh, we will rederive that part again, but, but so this is truly the most general kind of Feynman diagram we have to cope with. And, um, So the central observation is this, that if I take B, P1, mu, take B, uh, P, J, I take some particular momentum, some particular external momentum, and some particular component of that momentum. I keep applying it to I. I take N. Have I used N? Yes. <coughs> uh, I keep applying it to I. What's going to happen? Well, so try and think of the N as being sufficiently large. Well, let's just do it one at a time. This, this integral might be divergent. might have an ultraviolet divergent. We could always put some cutoff and regulate it, or put Pauli polaris and regulate it. That's fine. That just means that it's not, it's not ill-defined, but it is sensitive to this arbitrary ultraviolet cutoff. But now I start doing these derivatives. 
I do it once. I do one derivative. It could hit pj somewhere in this polynomial. Or it could hit the denominator somewhere, somewhere here. The one thing that we need to know is somewhere on, on in this picture, the j the j momentum gets injected. So there has to be at least one line. There has to at least be one of these propagators which has pj in it. Okay? Now, if, if, this, if I keep on differentiating with respect to the pj's, maybe I should first do, do, the, do the simple case. Suppose that this polynomial is independent of pj. That's the easiest case. Then every time I do one of these derivatives, I'm hitting one of these propagators, one or more of these propagators, okay, using the product. So, on that, uh, turning it into a So the form of differentiation is to do this. Now already something has improved in this integral that we have to do. Why? Because this thing for large Q this thing for large Q uh, behaves like 1 over Q squared. Whereas this thing for large Q goes like 1 over Q um, order 1 over Q. It could be smaller than 1 over Q squared, but it's at most 1 over Q squared. Whereas this thing is going like, it's going like order 1 over Q. Okay? If I didn't have that Q possibility, then it would literally go like 1 over Q to the fourth. The worst thing that could happen is that Q would be there, and then the ultraviolet would go like 1 over QQ. Okay. And you might think, wait, the Q is not like a, a single direction. But it is in the sense that, recall, we can quick rotate the Q integral. So, when you did this exercise, the homework, I, I, I got you to do the slightly slicker one where you took out, you used the Feynman trick. You wrote this integral using the Feynman parameterization. Um, I don't want to write that Feynman parameterization out when there are k propagators because we all fall asleep. 
but um, want to think of it as wick rotated after losing the final parameterization according to the homework problem we had. Uh, but the main thing is this. To decide whether the integral is convergent or divergent, the leading cause of divergence is the behavior of this integrand for large Q. That's what we're testing. If Q is, if, if, this, if this integrand is going like Q to the sixth, and, they, and I'm doing integral d4Q, then I'm going to get cut off to the tenth power. Okay, I'm going to get something which is blown up. If the integrand goes like 1 over Q to the seventeenth, and I'm doing integral d4Q for large Q, then I'm going to get something ultraviolet finite. So everything depends on how the integrand behaves, as far as finiteness is concerned, everything depends on how the integrand behaves for large Q. Okay? Now, what, whatever the behavior, let's suppose it was already divergent, okay? It was, I was integrating something and this thing was not behaving well for large Q. Well, one reason that it's not behaving well is that this particular propagator went like 1 over Q squared. And now, by differentiating it, things got a little bit better. Okay, so if this, if this integrand was going like Q to the 7th, by doing this derivative, it's now going like Q to the 6th. Okay? Yeah. So, I mean, can you differentiate under an integral if it's divergent? You can't, except you are supposed to have regulated. So you regulate the thing. But, but I, actually, what I really, so where I should really put it is just imagine, imagine that we have some sort of tally. So plus regulator dynamics. So when I take the regulator diagrams, as you played around with, you take some of these regulator diagrams and you combine the integrand, then indeed, the integral is convergent in the math to the mathematician. They say, "Look, this is convergent." To us, we are worried because we call it divergent because we said we have introduced this arbitrary cutoff scheme, and as a shorthand, we call it divergent. What we really mean is sensitive to this regular. But mathematically, the differentiation does work. Okay, so so this happens, but it still might not be convergent. If this thing was going like q to the 17th, and now it's going like q to the 16th, that's still not good. But the good news is, I can do it again, and again, and again. And eventually, I keep knocking down the amount of divergence by one unit every time I hit with a derivative. For large enough n, okay, for large enough n, corresponding to b to the n j mu i will, will be ultraviolet finite. Okay, eventually you're going to win. Now, at first it seems like, wait a second, sometimes if I differentiate, I might hit a pj in the, in the, in the polynomial here. And if it, you know, suppose I had a pj there. When I differentiate it, it doesn't change the degree of the divergence. It doesn't, it doesn't change the, the Q scale. The reason that the differentiation changed the Q scaling in, when acting on this object is because the P and the Q are tied together. It's too dumb to know that P and Q are separate. It treats them together. And so if you're differentiating with respect to P, it's equivalent to differentiating with respect to Q. And hence, you get this result. Okay. On the other hand, here, if you differentiate with respect to P of something in the numerator, it's not entangled with any Q necessarily. And so you might not be changing the degree, the, the, the divergence, of the scale of the Q. That seems to undercut what I just said. Except I'm willing to let you differentiate as many times as you want. So whatever this polynomial is, it's fixed by these Feynman rules in this diagram. It's a polynomial of some finite degree. Let's say it's polynomial order momentum to the 10th power. At most, they can be pj mu to the 10th. That means I can use up, after, after I take n bigger than 10, the worst thing that could happen is 10 of the derivatives knock out p to the 10th here, 
But then every other derivative has nowhere else to go but acting on these scalar denominators. And eventually I will win. Okay? So, so this is true, but it has a simple I, I, I've taken derivatives of just one component of one particular external momentum. Okay? But indeed, which one I chose, you can see, it, it really didn't matter because any particular momentum pj mu will be injected into one of these propagators or more, maybe more propagators. Okay. So here is the general statement. More generally, any example in a little more detail later, but um, so hence maybe I should <coughs> so right now this looks pretty bad. We're going to get integral d more q over q to the fourth for large q. That's log divergent. Write it out in many ways, and we will. But um, but let's just take d i p in the x direction. There's only one p, the x component of p, and, and, and just see what's going to happen. So this thing is, so you're going to get q squared minus m squared. You're going to get this thing again, but now the whole thing squared. And then this p plus q squared, you're going to get p plus q, the x component. Okay, so this is it. But you can see already that exactly what you said is right. Now, if I, if, even if I don't have a cutoff put in, this is just fine. The dumbest possible way is fine. Um, and just to save time later on, I'll do just one slight generalization. Any combination of external momenta uh, or mass. Think of these masses as some sort of calcified momentum. Masses energy. Normally you get to choose the momentum. A mass of course, mass parameter is a constant. Let's just check whether that's true. Here. If I differentiate with respect to m, 
then I'll square this, and then there'll be some 2m here. And it's going to be <coughs> convergent again. Again, these masses appear, they, the masses appear in either, got it, right? The masses appear in the denominators, in the whole propagator. So when you differentiate, you keep making things die off faster with q squared. They can appear in the numerator. After all, in a, in a spinner propagator, you have some sort of p slash minus m or plus m over p squared minus m. So there's an m there. So again, the numerator is polynomial in m. But for large enough n, any combinations of derivatives with respect to external momenta or masses leads to the same. So, I guess I'm wondering about how you use this finite piece that we did, because it seems to depend a lot on which derivatives we're taking. We will spend a little time worrying about it. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I, I have a question. Of right now, I have not said, I, 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 all I'm saying is that the derivatives are finite. We're about to, just a second, we're about to try to integrate back, back up. I don't want the derivatives of the Green's function, I just want the Green's function. We're going to have to see what that is, and it will come up there. But hold that up there. It was basically the same question as all. Sorry. Yeah. You weren't happy with my answer? No, I mean, you, I had the same question as him, and you told him to hold on. So oh, OK. So you're going to hold on. Great. Good, good. Um, OK, so, so now let's try and integrate back up what we're saying. Um, so this observation that you have several variables that your, in, that your integral depends on. And some species, let's say you have a set of three species of particles playing a role in these loops with masses m1, m2, and m3, then whatever you got was a function of these variables. Okay. Where I think of this as a variable, just for later, for later utility. In that case, I know that every combination of n of n derivatives in these several variables that this function depends on is ultraviolet finite. By which I mean is insensitive to the cutoff. Okay, you can take the cutoff to infinity and it won't change very much from a very large. That implies that just by integrating n times, that this is equal to something which is, well, if I integrate n times in every conceivable way with respect to these variables, p, p1 up to pn minus 1 and, and, and n alpha, I integrate in all possible ways n times, then all I can get is a polynomial of say degree n, whatever that n was. You don't have to be efficient to say what I'm saying. You don't have to choose. As long as you choose an n big enough, and then your neighbor chooses an even bigger n, which is overkill, it doesn't suddenly become false. Okay, so whatever n you want, as long as it's big enough, after you, all the derivatives are finite, and so the integral can be only can only be polynomial in these variables. Because these are all sorry, these are the integration constants. So I, I, I'm integrating back. I'm, I'm going to integrate. I'm just doing a many variables version of integrating all these finite functions. Okay, so If I integrate a bunch of finite functions, which are insensitive to the cutoff, I'll get the indefinite integral. And that's all I mean by this. So this is the indefinite integral
but there are a bunch of integration constants. The true answer, because it's the, all you can ever conclude is what the indefinite interval is, then there's then you're only correct modulo the integration constants, n fold integration constants, which are polynomials therefore. Right? And that's what this is. So if you want, I can I can either write this and say, look, this is sort of true, but but modulo, but but only the indefinite interval. Or I can kill the word indefinite and just say, there is some polynomial, however you decided to do these integrals. So that's it. Um, this is the result. This is the result we wanted, right? I didn't tell you that this UV finite derivative terms are analytic in momentum. They're not pol these are not polynomial in momentum. All that we know for sure by studying the Q squared fallout is that they are ultraviolet finally. <coughs> there may be ultraviolet divergences or there may not be ultraviolet divergences. But if there are ultraviolet divergences, this is where they are. Okay. The coefficients of this polynomial. So it's a direct attack on the structure of Feynman diagrams that tells us this simple, ultimately easy to state result. Ultraviolet divergences are local. That's the slope. Okay. Um, and it doesn't really matter about how complicated these Feynman rules are, as long as they came from some local Hamiltonian or local action. And it happened. Um, What's so great about this result? Um, but so the fact that the that was fact a rhetorical question. The original <laughs> integral divergence that doesn't necessarily mean anything back. So, so of course, let me let me put the regulator there to indicate that it's regulated. So we are good mathematicians in that sense. And and I, that's why I said the word UV sensitivity. UV sensitivity is lambda sensitivity. And this UV finite thing is, is lambda insensitive. External momenta are kept fixed at whatever values you want, and you take this to be much, much larger than whether you take it to infinity or whether you take it to be just very large, you get approximately the same answer. Yeah. And, and so I, mean, I, I guess my question was I'm trying to find a reason why we're not just saying, oh, we have an infinite constant, we're just going to set it to A, B, and C or something, like put in numbers for them. But maybe that's not what we're doing. Just that I shouldn't think of the infinite integral as being a real infinity for any physical answer. We would like to see that, but we're not there yet. We'd like to see that this result has some meaning like what you say. But and you may be intuitive that something like that seems like it smells like this. But my job is to make that sharp. So So at the operational level, it seems the whole uh, the regular, regulating idea is uh, if if you if you can show that uh, whatever you, your expression is after some finite number of differentiation, it gets finite answer, then all the infinities can be absorbed in the constants, and you don't have to do anything. Like you don't have to integrate anything or uh, all the expressions remain as it is and all the infinities are pulled into constants. So 
against that group, operationally we never do any calculations, we never do any manipulations, just... So, operationally, what you're saying is a way of proceeding. Don't ever bother to regulate anything. Just differentiate the diagram enough yes. times until it's finite. And that is just to check whether, whether it's three normal examples. Uh, but if we know that it, it becomes finite, if we can see it becomes finite of any number of differentiation, we don't even have to do that. Right? So as I said, the, 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 the place where there's at least, there's nothing wrong that is, it is possible to operate without ever having to see a ultraviolet regulator. You simply work at the level of the derivative of the, of the question you have, and then try and make sure that the integration constants, which you just think in the abstract are integration <coughs> constants, you don't ask are they dependent on the cutoff because you never introduced one. Yeah. You just try to make sure that those constants are measured by some experiment. Okay, so you, so you, so you, whether they are secretly sensitive to string theory or the space-time foam or whatever in ultraviolet and the ultraviolet, doesn't matter. Just call them constants and fit them to the data and move on. That is a way to proceed. You imply that they are the simplest way to proceed, meaning therefore everybody is. This is really what everybody's doing, and that's not true. That is. People are actually regulating diagrams. And partly, there is the question of efficient calculation of even these ultraviolet finite bits and the separation of, so you know, there's a question that this indefinite integral means that the separation into this and this is arbitrary. Yeah. You can always take a finite polynomial, add it to here, and subtract it from here. Yeah. And that would have been also another another integral of all the derivatives, right? Yes. Now, in that separation, there are ways of, cal I mean, there are regularizations where people can agree in a very simple way on how much of the polynomial should, how much of a finite polynomial should be added here and here. How do you make this separation? And so, in, in practical circumstances, people are often using a regulator the regulator that is most commonly used is dimensional regularization, and the professionals are actually using it, as opposed to the kind of renormalization, I forget, BH, B, what is it called? BPHZ. BPHZ, renormalization, which is what you've just outlined. You never see a regulator work only at the level of sort of the derivatives of the question you're asking and show that just the derivatives allow you to fit to the experiments. That is a elegant, clear, no-nonsense way of doing it. Oddly enough, that's not what people mostly are doing. So nothing. There, so there's, there, there is no obstruction to doing what you're saying, and in the end, the decision as to so the fit to experiment can proceed in one of two ways. We've seen this already in the self-energy case. You can either have very physical, meaning very close to experiment, renormalization conditions. For any particular process that you're interested in, or class of processes. And then you can, these are like the on shell renormalization schemes. I refer you back to our earlier discussion. Um, and these are very convenient if you know a, a very small subset of processes that you're interested in. And you can bypass the regular, you can, you can do exactly what you say. In a more general purpose situation where you have many processes of interest, uh, the renormalization conditions are, are a pain in the neck to state in terms of very, very physical measurements. 
So there's a kind of intermediate point where you choose normalization conditions which are easy to express for theorists and harder for the experimentalists to fit to. Okay? Uh, that is to say, the renormalized couplings are not very simple, like that renormalization, that renormalized coupling is just that experiment there. That other one is just that one there. That's easy. Instead, you do it in some way that's easy for theorists, and the one that's easiest, which we're come to soon, is called minimal subtraction. And it's very closely based on a regularization. So I can't say that there's something, you know, there's some big principle that's stopping you doing what you're doing. But the common language that theorists and experimentalists agree on in the most broadly based set of um, the approach to a, a broad range of experiments, they do use regularizations. But it is true that in a very restricted range of types of experiments where we're going to spend several years on just something. Okay. Uh, the theorists and experimentalists in that game will often do something which would strike you as closer to what you just said. Derivatives so that you never see the infinities. Directly fixing those coefficients, etc., from experiments in a very efficient way. You don't have the kind of complications associated with the regulator. Conceptually, it's useful to have the regulator. I'm not against it. And it reminds us that while we are partly trying to work towards a, a renormalized field theory, a theory in which mention of a higher scale that makes everything finite, the regulator being a proxy for that, uh, that we don't need that. It's about as realistic to talk about the regulator in such a circumstance as it is to talk about epsilon and delta in the process of calculating derivatives. Okay, uh, just an intermediate regulator. But the whole exercise we're going through is only a small step from what is called effective field theory, where you really think there is some new physics well beyond your experimental range. And you're trying to actually understand to what extent you're sensitive to it and to what extent you're not. So it's really there. And in that case, it's very useful to keep that kind of regulator as a kind of reminder of what might be out there. So the subject has sort of proceeded with a heavy reliance on the regulator, but it's not appreciated that in principle you can do it now. Um, some of this might be apparent in the rest of the story. Uh, Let's do this one. Um, I of P is equal to integral dQ, let's just make it one dimensional, and uh, over Q um, so, well, here, let me, let me pretend I need here. I cannot shift away, I cannot just shift away the P by calling this Q prime because my lower limit is zero. Okay. So think of this as some sort of a schematic of one of those things where the Q is the, the radial direction of Euclidean momentum. Okay. So this looks like it doesn't make any sense. This is clearly logarithmically divergent. So let us simply uh, put a cutoff on Q in the dumbest way try and probably apply it right here. I don't mind if you also subtract a 1 over q plus p plus lambda. That's also OK. Then don't do all stuff. But here, let's just do the dumb thing. Whatever, this. No, let me not. Let me not. Probably belongs. OK, so here it is. I feel guilty. 1 over q plus p 
minus 1 over q plus p plus lambda. Okay. It's a nice regulator, as I already told you about how these are, in that for if the q was only naively small, fixed, like p, would be something small, this would be actually doing nothing. It would be adding 0, because lambda is so damn big. The only place they'll hit, oh, but if q misbehaves in the integral and becomes big, then actually this is knocking off the worst of the bad behavior. And now this thing, this thing now goes like 1 over q squared, once q is much bigger than lambda. Okay, so suddenly the integral converges. So first of all, let's agree this is a regulator. It does, in fact, take the naive expression and make it finite. But you know what? We can actually do all these integrals. And so, what is it? The first one is, there's, a, there's the, at the ultraviolet, this term is bad. If you look, we can combine the denominators. But let me just do it. There's, there's, a log of, there's a log of infinity over p. Okay. Q, q equals 0, then, then you'd get p. So, and, and there, but there'd be another term which cancels the, the, the ultraviolet bad behavior. But now it's, so you're, so you're going to get something that looks like log of p plus lambda over p. Um, indeed, if lambda is really big, the leading sensitivity to the cutoff is, 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 is just this. Okay, so, so here's the answer. Um, is it sensitive? Is I of P sensitive to the cutoff? You bet. This is log sensitive to the cutoff. Um, what about DP of I of P? 